Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For those who don't know what that means, it means peace be upon you in the Arabic language. It is a common phrase used by Muslims when we're greeting each other. You don't necessarily have to be Muslim to use that greeting, but we'd like to, we'd like to invite you guys to start using it, especially when speaking with Muslims. It will really bring a smile on the Muslim's face. So welcome to our last lecture of the Islamic Awareness Week. Uh, it's very, I'm very happy to see all of you guys here, alhamdulillah. And pretty much what we're going to start with is just a small introduction to what we're going to be doing today. And then a panel discussion with our Imams. Afterwards, after around an hour, if you have any questions, please go to this website here. It's called menti.com. M-E-N-T-I dot com. And enter that code that you see on the wall. If you cannot see it, just ask anyone around you. Execs will be on that watch out for whoever needs to ask questions. You write your questions anonymously. After one hour of the panel discussion, we will be answering the questions one by one, inshallah. And for those who don't know, don't know what inshallah means, it means God willing. And uh, awesome. thank you guys for coming. This is a chance for Muslims and non-Muslims to introduce Islam to their non-Muslim colleagues, non-Muslim roommates, and an opportunity for them to learn about Islam. So thank you guys for coming again. Inshallah, we'll start off with uh, one of Imam Yahya from Masjid Salam in Burnaby. And uh, we just I just like to observe proper etiquette here. We have some seniors here, so if you guys, if any brothers here are a little too loud, I'd like to keep them, you know, keep your voice down a little bit because we don't want that to happen to the class halakha. But we'll start with Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. First of all, Jazakumullah Khairan uh, to the brothers and sisters from the MSA uh, who spent the past week uh, teaching uh, their fellow uh, classmates and uh, uh, campus goers about Islam. And for the non-Muslim audience that we have here with us today, uh, I encourage you to use this opportunity. Uh, you know, it's hard enough to get uh, one imam to sit in a room with you. And today, mashallah, you have three. So, um, you know, you can use this as an opportunity to ask any question that you have. So I, I will, you know, make some brief comments before that. But I, I would encourage you to use this opportunity. And... Uh, um, I'm going to speak on behalf of my two colleagues that it's very hard to offend us. So it's, uh, you know, you can ask literally whatever you want, right? So anything that, uh, uh, that you wanted and uh, you, you have been wanting to ask uh, a Muslim imam or maybe even a Muslim classmate, but uh, you couldn't uh, muster up the courage to do this, then this is your opportunity anonymously, inshallah, and we will answer those questions. The purpose of today's discussion is, or the discussion itself is going to center around uh, what we as Muslims call the Hadith of Jibreel or the Hadith of Gabriel. And uh, most of the Muslims in the room, you should know what this is. This is the famous Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where uh, I will read and narrate the Hadith to you in a moment. Uh, but this is a very well-known tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And for the non-Muslim audience, uh, this hadith, hadith means uh, a narration that is either they are the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or they are a companion narrating something that took place in the presence of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in this case, this is something that took place in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this hadith is, uh, is famously narrated by many companions. And to begin this uh, with the permission of my colleagues, inshallah, I'm going to narrate the hadith to you um, in its entirety so that uh, those of you who may not have heard it before can hear it for the first time. And then we are going to talk about this hadith and uh, each one of us is going to inshallah talk about one of the three elements of the hadith. So the, the version I narrate uh, to you is uh, the narration of Imam Abu Dawood and uh, this is narrated by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says that we were sitting in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when a man with strikingly white clothing and strikingly black hair appeared before us. And he says, لا يرى عليه أثر الصفر ولا نعرفه. 
He describes him by saying that we couldn't see apparent on his person any signs that he had been traveling, yet none of us recognized who he was. And then he goes on to describe the, the strange mannerisms of this individual, something that is atypical to someone who is sitting in the presence of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, again, for the non-Muslim audience, when, when any one of us says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is an honorific uh, used uh, the, when mentioning the name of the Messenger. It means may the peace and blessings of, uh, of God be upon the Prophet uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says that he sat in the in front of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he sat in such close proximity that his knees were touching the knees of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he put his hands on the thighs of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he began to address him. He says, "Ya Muhammad." Now again, this is atypical. You typically don't address uh, someone of. Uh, of the Prophet's stature using his name. So again, this is all of these things are to draw attention to this person. So he says, Ya Muhammad, that O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, akhbirni anil Islam, tell me about Islam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Islam is that you bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and you bear witness that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah. And you perform, you establish your salah, you give your zakah, you fast Ramadan, and you perform the pilgrimage of the house if you are able to. And this man, this, the same one who asked the question, he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. And again, uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala, who is narrating the hadith, he says that, you know, we were perplexed regarding this man that he asks the question, and upon receiving the answer, he, you know, he affirms the answer. He says, yes, this answer is correct. The, so this is something that was strange. This is out of place. How can the person asking the question then also deem the answer of that question to be satisfactory and correct? And then he asked the second question. He says, tell me about Iman. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, Iman or faith is you believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, the last day, and you believe in destiny, both good and bad. And again, the man responded by saying, this is correct. You have spoken correctly. And then he asked the question that tell me about Ihsan. And uh, again, I'm, I'm purposely not translating what Ihsan means, that uh, my colleagues will tell you that in a moment, inshallah. And he says that Ihsan is you worship Allah as if you can see him, and if you cannot achieve this level, then at least you understand that he sees you. And then he goes on to ask, that, tell me about the hour. And he says that the person who is being, the Prophet sallallahu replied, مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ The person who is being asked is not more knowledgeable regarding this matter than the person who is, who is asking. And then he says that, tell me about the signs of the hour. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and tell you the that the slave woman will give birth to her master, and you will see uh, people who hufat al urat al ala ri'a al shai yatawaluna fil bunyan. That this means that these are people who are dwellers of the desert; they are barefoot, and uh, they. Um, they begin competing in the construction of lofty structures. يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ Then he says that uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala who says ثُمَّ انطلق, This man, he turned around and he left. And I waited for three days. And you know, I was thinking about this strange encounter for an entire three days. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the third day, he said, Ya Umar, do you know who this man was? Do you know who the person asking the questions was? And uh, as, as usual, he replied that Allah and his messenger know best. And the Prophet, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon hearing this, he replied, إِنَّهُ جِبْرَائِلْ أَتَاكُمْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ That this was Jibrail, he came to teach you your, your deen. So this was Gabriel, he came to teach you your deen. So this, this entire narration is what we refer to as the hadith of Jibrail, or the hadith of Gabriel. And subhanAllah, this is, uh, you know, one of the most widely, vastly, accurately transmitted hadith that exists in the entire hadith corpus. And it contains some of the most profound and fundamental lessons that our faith is, uh, is based upon. And what I have been tasked with talking about is Iman. 
So Iman is, uh, is what we would uh, loosely translate as belief. So the, the belief component, the theology aspect of our faith, this is Iman. And what Iman is? So, um, you know, Iman, linguistically, what Iman means is إِعْطَاءُ الْأَمْنِ وَالْطُمَأْنِينَ what this means is Iman is literally to give peace and tranquility. To give peace and tranquility. So Iman, your belief, this is literally the means of your peace and tranquility and your salvation in the Akhirah according to the Muslim belief. The Akhirah is the afterlife. So as Muslims we believe, and I will go over the six elements of faith, that the six elements of our belief that, you know, one of those elements is that we believe in the last day. We believe that there will be a time where after you leave this world you will be held accountable for your performance inside this world for the temporary and very short period of time that you lived here you will be held accountable for your actions that you performed both good and bad and the second linguistic definition of iman is um, there is a there is a saying in the arabic language that a thing is defined by defining its opposite so the opposite of iman is at takdhib a takdhib means to deem something untruthful, to, to call something a lie. This is a takdhib. So therefore the opposite of this is iman. So means iman is a tasdiq. It means to deem something truthful. And what this means is that we believe and we deem truthful the entire message brought to us by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as is preserved in the Quran and his sunnah and the teachings of the generations of scholars that were tasked by God to preserve these teachings. And my brothers and sisters, uh, I will briefly touch upon uh, the six elements of faith. So who has gone to Quran school when they were young? Most of the Muslims, you have gone to Quran school, right? So, who's from the subcontinent? Okay. So, those from the subcontinent, they tend to, uh, they, they call these uh, the, the kalimas, right? The kalima is, these are literally, you, uh, you are learning your belief. Now, the trouble sometimes in the, the subcontinent is that you, you memorize the Arabic part, but you're actually not taught what it means. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's a different story. But uh, in general, uh, the, the very uh, last uh, kalima, this is your, your beliefs uh, in, in detail. So does anybody want to recite this last kalima for me? I need to make sure that you stay awake for the much more interesting things that are coming after me. Right? So, amantu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawmi al akhiri wal qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allah ta'ala wal ba'thi ba'd al mawt so these are literally uh, the the summary of your belief so we believe in god amantu billahi wa malaikatihi his angels wa kutubihi his books that his revelations that were sent to this world wa rusulihi his messengers wal yawmi al akhir we believe in the last day we believe that every human being will stand before god to uh, and god will take this person to account wal qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min allah ta'ala means that destiny both good and bad anything good or bad that happens in your world this is destined by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and al ba'th ba'd al maut is that we believe in a life after death so everything else right everything else usually um, for the muslim sitting inside the, 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 this room over here all other parts of aqidah right they can you, they are usually, and you are studying Aqidah with, uh, with uh, Imam Yama, so he will also tell you this, that a lot of the difference of opinion and noise that is made with regards to differences in Aqaid are, uh, you know, can usually boil down to some semantic differences, right? So what is and what is not permissible, what are the boundaries, but everybody agrees on these seven things, right? Or these six things, that this is um, this is the, the Muslim belief, and this is the belief that is mentioned inside this hadith as well. And uh, the last uh, thing that I will mention is iman and amal salih. Right. So we are 
as Muslims, we believe we are a nation of action, right? So uh, belief in theology is fine, um, and we can talk about this, but if it is not accompanied with, with positive virtuous actions and a positive influence on yourself, your family, and the world around you, then this is not sufficient for your salvation. And proof of this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside the Quran, he mentions give or take about 59 times a phrase الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ That people who believe and they practice virtue. People who believe and they do good deeds. People who believe and they perform virtuous actions. However you want to translate this, but it's, you know, the scholars, they say that الْإِيمَان مَقْرُونٌ بِالْعَمَلِ That iman that is accompanied with virtuous action, this is the only thing that can attain you salvation. So belief in itself is not sufficient. Virtuous actions without belief is definitely not sufficient. It requires both. So there is no such thing as, um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is an introduction to the Muslim practical um, application of the faith. So we as Muslims, we don't believe in just being a good person, right? without actually performing the actions necessary. We don't believe in believing in your own way. We believe that belief is something that is divine, that is shown to us by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his noble companions and the generations of scholars that came after them to preserve our teachings. And we believe that action is a necessary component of belief. So just believing is, you know, we believe that anybody who leaves this world that with Iman in their heart will eventually one day be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after serving uh, at their, their time and uh, if there is a punishment for them. But um, in order to attain salvation, right, uh, without, the, without the punishment that comes before it, it requires iman and virtuous actions, right? So this is the last part that you must realize that only iman is not enough only virtuous actions is also not enough it they must be in uh, uh, they must be combined with one another and this is uh, you know not once not twice not even 10 times how many times did allah mention this in the quran 59 times right so 59 so, times allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this exact phrase الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Those who believe and they perform virtuous actions. So this is, uh, you know, just a brief glimpse into the, the theological component of the Muslim belief. So this is the, the part that is Iman. And inshallah, uh, the, uh, Mufti Shujaat uh, will, uh, I'm actually not sure exactly which part Mufti Shujaat Shujaat is going to talk about. Islam. 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 So the, the Shaykh is going to talk about the, the first part of the hadith. Uh, this is Islam. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to him, inshallah. How much time do we have? 15, 20 minutes, inshallah. Here. 
the, I would like all of us to bear in mind the significance of this occasion in light of the significance of the hadith that we are studying here or discussing at the moment. Because occasions are decided and defined by the activity that takes place. And therefore, the hadith, as the scholars of hadith literature have rightfully said, Hadith Jibreel is probably the single most important narration in the entire Hadith corpus and the Hadith literature, as the Shaykh has alluded to. Therefore, Imam Qurtubi Ta'ala, he stated that this Hadith is known and classified as Umm Sunnah, the foundation, the foundation of Hadith to the, to the entire Hadith literature, the Bunyad, the foundation, the Asas. And not only that, Ibn Hajar Asqalani rahimahullah ta'ala, I'm giving you the background for us to appreciate the occasion. So he says in Fatih al-Bari, the very monumental commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was tasked for the final time before his physical departure from this world. And a religion that was being revealed to him over 23 years period of time. Just think about it. Just 80 days before he departed from this world in a physical sense. Jibreel alayhi comes and poses the question that we have just heard. He says it is so that the Ummah once again learns the, sum of the summary of our entire deen in its essence. That was the purpose of it. So as we sit here, we are actually recalling that moment and reconnecting ourselves to this legacy. And therefore, this occasion becomes very significant for us. Now, the second point is, as we have several non-Muslim audience here present, I very much welcome you and thank you for joining us. If we are to approach this question, from a theological and religious perspective, the following question, what is that? What is the purpose of our existence and our, our creation in this world? This is something that Quran itself has asked in numerous places. We believe as per the Quranic narrative, there is nothing in this universe that God created that has no purpose to it. There is nothing whatsoever. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, And one of the known quotes of the East, those of us who know Urdu would appreciate what he said. But he says that even an atom or even anything as, as insignificant as Adam itself that you pick on and that you collect. All of these that you see scattered all over the universe, they have a purpose of existence. They have a maqsad behind it. So what about the, the jewel of the creation of Allah, human beings? So Quran itself says, abasa. Do you think that we have created it without a purpose? And then Quran itself responds to this question. And that is in the known surah, Surah Al-Dhariyat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and all of us have heard this ayat, but I want to turn your attention to a different aspect of it. That, you know, We created mankind and also jinn to worship Allah, to worship our Creator. So the word يَعْبُدُونَ is not just to pray, to fast, right? rather to recognize him as Ibn Abbas is in the tafsir of this ayah, the commentary of this ayah is in the Ya'rifun, so that you recognize who your Creator is. And another tafsir says, it is actually to, because Abd is from Ubudiyah, the true servitude, submission. So what it means here is that we live our whole life, we live our whole life in submission, in servitude to God. Each and everything that we do, it should be aligned in, 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 in relation to what God has commanded. That's, this ayat defines the purpose of our existence. And Islam is all about this. And Islam is all about this. So we are just ex 
you know, exploring, exploring some aspects of it here today. But if you make a deeper, you know, deeper dive, you will understand that Islam is all about submission, the entire submission, the ultimate submission to God's commands. Now, moving forward, the hadith itself that you have just heard, and Shaykh has translated it very well, mashallah. You have noticed the format that it is based on. It's a very interesting format. It's generally, you know, we love to have Q&A sessions, right? So I would call it like Q&A plus A. Question, answer, and an affirmation. Because that's what Jibreel والسلام, did at the end. He affirmed the answer that Rasulullah gave him. The scholars of hadith, looking at this aspect of the hadith, they mentioned the following, that essentially there are three types of questions that a person would experience, generally speaking. The first being is al-ittiham, and the second al-istifham, the third ta'lim. So what, is, what does it mean, Ittiham? The questions that are essentially to accuse someone of something, that you suspect somebody that he might or she might have done something or didn't do, that they are claiming. So what do you say? Didn't you really do this? Or did you really do that? So this is Ittiham, accusation. And the second type is Al-Istifham. It is that رَفْعُ الْجَهْلِ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ It is to remove ignorance of oneself regarding something that he or she does not know of. This is what istifham means, something that I don't know that I ask you and you, something that you don't know you ask. This is what we call istifham. The third is ta'lim, neither the first nor the two. It is actually, yani, what does it mean? It means that you, the one who is questioning knows the answer, yet he questions with the intention to educate the crowd, the audience that are present in the gathering. And this, subhanAllah, scholars of hadith, they have called this type of question as Su'adat Jibreeliyah. Su'adat Jibreeliyah. Because, so which one do you think out of three? The format that we find in the hadith, what is first, second, or third? Third, right? Because Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, he asked the question, then when Rasulullah answered, he affirmed the answer. So this is the third one. But something I just want to add here. In, in this day and age, the Mashaykh can attest to this. I sometimes have seen this happening as well. There is a fourth category, I would say, that sometimes some individuals, they ask the question to test the knowledge of the other person. Sometimes, Mashaykh, they have people who come to them and ask the question, Shaykh, what is the ruling of this? And then when you give the ruling, they say, I already know it. So if you, do, if you, really knew, if you knew that, then why are you asking it? As if they are they're trying to test the knowledge of the scholar. Astaghfirullah Azim. So these are just the four types that we can say that you know, the, these are the natures of the Christians. Now, the hadith, the, the portion of the hadith that I am to speak about, I want to now get to that part. So the word Islam, and because this hadith, as I said, has been rated in all the major books of hadith. There is not a single hadith, whether it's Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Sunil Majah, Nasai, all of them. There are some variations to this narration in, those, in these books. However, the essence, the message remains the same. So this hadith, as it begins with respect to the first question, according to any Imam Muslim rahimahullah and the one that she also narrated here. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, he came and asked Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Muhammad, akhbirni ala al-Islam. So the, the word Islam, let us define what Islam is in linguistic term and also in religious sense. You know, in the very known dictionary, the Sal al Arab, it is defined as from Sil, and Sil refers to Sulh, reconciliation. And what do you achieve through reconciliation? Can anyone tell me here? When you, if you are not a good term with somebody, now there is a reconciliation that takes place between you and the other person. So at the end, what do you achieve? Peace, peace right? MashaAllah. So this is how it is connected to peace. But it literally mean, the literal meaning of the word silm is actually sulh. But through reconciliation, you attain peace, you achieve peace. And from that we have Islam. So 
is your hand once of over to someone like as if the person is your your lead your 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 guide and you are just following him so in this sense allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is leading us in each and every aspect of our life and subhanallah there is a beautiful ayat in surah al-ankabut allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says alladhina jahadu fina lanahdiyannahum surlana walladhina jahadu fina lanahdiyannahum surlana one of these scholars of tafsir of our recent past Shaykh Ashraf Ali Al-Tanabi rahimahullah that he has translated this ayat those who strive sincerely in the path of Allah to follow his religion as if Allah will guide them holding their hand step by step as if Allah is literally showing you the way very clear ahead of you so this is what Islam is in the literal sense and also in religious term it is to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the only one being worthy of worship and also to believe in the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the finality of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the last messenger to come. Now, looking at Quranic narrative of this word, this is something might be of benefit to all of us, hopefully, inshallah. The word Islam, in its, with its different derivatives, has been used in the Quran approximately in about 70 plus verses nearly 70 plus verses have used the word Islam in different forms. Some scholars, they have looked at these ayat and they concluded that these ayat, they define, for, and if you add this hadith to it as well, four different types of Islam in the broadest sense and in the also specific sense. So the, what is the first one, the first type? The first type is the one that is related to the nature and the universe. And it is by fitrah, by the nature, that the whole, that the whole existence in, is in the absolute submission to God. The whole existence, the whole creation, and the, the universe itself is also in the absolute submission to God. And there are numerous ayat in the Quran. Yani what, do, what does it mean? The way Allah decided their path to traverse their life and to the trajectory that was set for them, they never de deviate from that. Sun, the goal of sun is to rise, to shine the world. It will never disobey. Moon, the earth, everything is in absolute submission to God in that sense. And therefore, there is an ayat in the Holy Quran in Surah Ali Imran. God the Almighty says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rajim, Afaghira Deen Allahi Yabghun. وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا Subhanallah. Allah says, Are these people addressing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeking a religion other than Islam? Do they not know? While the reality is that the whole universe is in absolute submission to God. طَوْعًا وَكَرْهًا Willingly or unwillingly. In both cases. So this is the first type of Islam that Quran describes. So in, in according to, I mean, in this context, the whole universe is as if Muslim. You understand? That's, this is how we define it. And this is how we understand it from the Quranic verses. Now the second one is the Islam of the prophetic traditions. The Islam of the prophetic traditions. We also find these numerous narration, uh, ayat in the Holy Quran. All the prophets that Bible talks about, that you know, Torah talks about, and the Quran itself talks, talk about, talks about, they all have lived their life in accordance with the orders of God, and hence submitted themselves throughout their life to God. So they lived their life, the life of servitude, the submission. And in this sense, they all have been Muslims. And I will give you some examples from the Holy Quran. For example, when it comes to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that with qala lahu rabbuhu aslim qala aslam to rabbil alim when Allah commanded Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam to be Muslim, he said aslam to li rabbil alim I submitted myself. Likewise, the followers, the disciples and the apostles of Prophet Jesus peace be upon him they said we are the helpers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَشْهَدْ بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ And that you be witness that we are Muslims. So this is the second type. And the third one is 
the one that we are in somehow in, in some way talking about it today. It is the historical Islam, historical Islam, which was brought by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in seventh century CE, and it is the final form of of the ultimate submission to God that was taught and brought by all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And what is the proof for this? We find the ayat in the Quran: "Al yom atmantu lakum dina." So this ayah says that the journey of Islam that started with Adam والسلام, that it continued up until the time of Prophet وسلم, and it, it completed in his lifetime. So in, in its final form. And the fourth one is the one that, that is very specific type of Islam which is mentioned and discussed in this hadith. Now the, the portion of the hadith that you have heard Islam is a, it rests upon five pillars. Right? These are the pillars that are known as arkan al Islam. So iman, as she talked about, that is something internal. It is it is related to your belief. The one as you are sitting here, I don't know what what belief do you hold, when what beliefs do I hold? But when it comes to Islam, it is outward manifestation of our faith. It is the external. Yes, because we use our body to carry these acts out and fulfill them. So the, and the first pillar is, of course, is the declaration of faith, as we talked about it. And there are a few other in interesting points that I wanted to go over. Time is up. I will just try to mention in, in four or five minutes uh, the remaining points. So with respect to the declaration of faith, what did Rasul Sallallahu say? And tashhad, that you bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And scholars of hadith they said and fuqaha also because the suicide said you bear witness yani verbally verbally not that you just believe in your mind therefore it is necessary theoretically it is necessary for each and every Muslim at least to utter shahada once in their lifetime. Although we say it many times alhamdulillah when we perform salat towards the end of salat we recite the shahada right but I'm just trying to explain this point from a filthy perspective and an aqidah that it is at least necessary that we recite once this in our entire lifetime. And now the other thing that is important to note here is that all the other arkan, they are actions. When it comes to the shahada, it seems as if it's not action. But subhanAllah, in Islam, it ha Islam has taken the statements to the next level of accountability. And responsibility. What do I mean by that? It means that in Islam our statements are also treated as actions. Our statements are also treated as actions and there are numerous proofs for that. For example in Surah Al-Qaf Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَذِهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Any statement that you make don't think it will just vanish in the air. It, there is an angel, his job is just, to, just to, to write down and to count and preserve each and every statement of yours and, and ours that we say and it is going to be recorded and will be presented. And the known hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, we know that Rasul Sallallahu said, should I not, it's a long lengthy narration but towards the end of it, Rabbi Sallallahu said, should I not inform you Mu'ad of the summation and the foundation of all what I have explained to you. He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. Then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi held his tongue like this. Kuffa hadha, amsik hadha. Restrain your tongue. Restrain your tongue. And then he said, do you, not, do you not know that most of the people will end up in Jahannam because of the abuse of their tongue? Because of the abuse of their We don't know, we don't care what we say to people, how we hurt their sentiments and feelings. Right? But in Islam, it is very, very important. And therefore, Imam Malik Rahimahullah that said, if a person is to realize and acknowledge this aspect seriously, and if he is intelligent enough, smart enough, then much of his speech will vanish, because he would know that I am going to be held accountable for this on the Day of Judgment. So the rest is about Salat, for example, five daily prayers that we pray, and then Zakat, which is once a, once a year. Fiqh Ahkam is not the place to discuss here, and then fasting in the month of Ramadan, and Hajj, which is uh, once in a lifetime, Though they are very distinct, I'm just wrapping up now here, they are distinct from each other, but internally they are connected because of the intention and the purpose that they have, which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars they have said that these ibadat, they are goal-oriented. 
besides worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are very different and unique, right? But they're, they're, what, are, what are the goals set for them? There are moral lessons, spiritual insights, as Imam Ghazali rahimahullah wa ta'ala has talked about in Ihya. It is something worth reading, each and every one of us, because the translation of Ihya is also available in English. So if you go through, you will see the spiritual dimension of all of these ibadat. What are we expected to learn? It's not like robotic movement. There are things that we are required to learn. If you remain focused on that, then you will improve the quality of your ibadat and also your servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last but not least, these ibadat, as scholars they say, that they are a training ground for us. A training ground for us not to limit ourselves just to these ibadat. Remember, Islam is a complete code of life. So, but it is to build upon and to extend so that they are to make us a true believer, a devout believer in each and every sense of the word. So these are just the some reflections from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to appreciate the beauty of our faith. And therefore, you know, the, the scholar said the reason that our religion was chosen, the name that was given to our religion as Islam, not naming it after the founders of the religion like Christianity, for example, Buddhism, or Hinduism, or region or ethnicity, rather Islam, because it truly defines our relationship with our Creator, between creation and Creator. This is why it has been named as Islam. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace and blessings be upon you all. Alhamdulillah, in the presence of my dear beloved teachers, Allah preserve them both. It's a pleasure to be with you all. On this evening, I've been assigned to speak about the last part of this session, Ihsan. And before I speak about this, um, I often used to use this hadith of Jibreel, peace and blessings be upon him, to present to people the general teachings of Islam. Because on the one hand, as you saw, I have it at a very simple level. You have things that you believe in, which has rooted in the heart. And then there are things that you practice outwardly, which are mainly Islam. But then there's the element of Ihsan, which is translated in many different ways. It's translated as Sufism. It's translated as spiritual excellence. It is the spiritual component of this beautiful religion. That is a continuation, as Muslims believe, from the time of Adam, to Noah, to Moses, to Jesus, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of them, this religion has always been the same religion and taught by the wonderful prophets throughout the centuries. Now, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, explained it as Ihsan is that you worship Allah as if you see Him. And if you do not see Him or behold Him, know and be aware that God sees you. Now, the bulk of spirituality of Islam is looking at our actions and how to make them beautiful. How do you achieve sincerity? That is the department of the science. We're gonna call it for now, Ihsan, just to stick with the main safe definition as when you use certain words that has connotations, people misunderstand. There's a Sufism now in North America that is detached from Islam as a religion, and it's just a practice. That cannot be. Sufism, or Ihsan, or Tasawwuf, or Tazkiyat al-Nafs, whatever you want to call it, these are just names that indicate the reality of the science, which is deeply rooted at the purification, and the removal of evil traits of the heart and the filling of it of noble prophetic qualities. So on the one hand, you can say, what does a Muslim do to achieve this spiritual excellence? Number one, they have to seek knowledge. Because a class that I teach online right now is about the diseases of the heart. This is a fundamental focus of Islamic spirituality. There's envy, jealousy, hatred, rancor, arrogance, vanity. These are all diseases of the heart. 
And the individual that does not purify their heart cannot be in a state to worship God with vigilance, with awareness, with deep piety. The way that this is achieved is upholding and protecting the outward laws of Islam. Because the outward laws of Islam are there to give the individual a path to achieve spiritual excellence. So there's no way you can have spiritual excellence without practicing and adhering to the limits and the confinement of the sacred laws. Nor can you have the sacred law and perfect spirituality without having correct alignment of your faith, correct beliefs. This is core and actually preface before all for the accepting uh, exceptions or acceptance of good deeds. So I want to give everyone here just a brief outlook on what the early Muslims did. The early Muslims at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad was the source of all spirituality. He highlighted and helped people with the things that they struggled with. Now when you struggle with an addiction, when you struggle with something that you are addicted to and that's not good for you, this is the area that solves that problem. It is deeply rooted in purifying the heart of all those diseases that I mentioned. And it is also then, once the heart is emptied of foul traits, then you, as if you're going to fill up a vessel, you first pour it out, then you pour in it noble and virtuous qualities, such as gratitude. A true Sufi, if you will, is the one that is full of gratitude. Gratitude for their eyesight, gratitude for existence itself. Existence itself is a joy. It is a joy to be alive. That's why nobody really wants to die. Because existence itself is an expression of God's mercy and joy in your heart. You have gratitude for so many things that we don't realize. The only people that truly know what to be grateful for are those blessings that you lose, even the simplest things like seeing colors, hearing, seeing, being happy, being having all these blessings requires in Islam a gratitude. And gratitude is not uh, once a year Thanksgiving dinner. I, I'm from the U.S. and I forgot that yesterday was Thanksgiving. It's the time of the year when people want to thank God for something or whatever they want to thank, be thankful for. It's not always rooted to God. But we as Muslims, we root and we direct all of our blessings to God. And then to also put in, carry on the, the beautiful qualities of patience, of, um, of reliance, sincerity, and many other qualities that the spiritual path focuses on. But ultimately, one of the things that the spiritual path focuses on is to realign your understanding of who you are and your relationship directly with God. That's really what it boils down to. There's a beautiful scholar by the name of Imam Ibn Atayla. Ibn Atayla, a secondary, was one of the fundamental great, or you can say a core figure in Islamic history that wrote what is called the aphorisms. That's translated as well. Much of that book focuses on the ailments of the heart, the distance of the human being. Much of the early Sufis were all about finding their joy and happiness in the divine itself. God Almighty himself, that they believed and adhered to, that once you find God, as Imam Ibn Atayla in one of his uh, aphorisms says, that the one who found God, what did he really lose? And the one that loses God, we can say purpose and meaning. Without God, we would, as Muslims would say, you don't know the divine purpose of why God created you. To know meaning and have purpose and direction brings peace to the heart. Knowing that there are better things that go beyond this world bring about a happiness and joy in the heart. So the one who loses all that, what did they find other than temporality? This world is a temporary zone. It's not going to last forever. And one of the poets, he said, isn't it other than God, everything is not. Meaning, in reality, it is dissipating before our very eyes. Every moment, everything that you're built of is in a state of deterioration, annihilation. 
All that will always remain and has always remained will be God. Therefore, if you attach your heart and your worship and your spirituality and your love and your reliance and your sincerity and direct it all to God, then God will enrich you by making you a true submitted servant with utmost peace because you have now perfected the quality that God wanted from you, which is to be the viceroy and representative of God on earth. That despite your evil promptings and evil insinuations and, and susceptibilities and humanness, you excelled all that and you became saintly. And also I'll end with this, that there's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, again a prophetic saying in which he narrated that God Almighty said, that my servant does not draw near to me with anything more beloved than that which I have made obligatory upon them. And they will continue to draw near to me after that with nothing more beloved than that which I have made as supererogatory, optional upon them until I love them. And that is the greatest achievement. The Prophet Muhammad's title is Habibullah, the beloved of God, because how do you know God loves you? How do you know you've achieved that rank? Is that you love God and everything about God is what your whole life is all surrounded by. You see God in everything. I was driving here on the way and I'm like, this fall of Canada has continued. What beautiful display of divine perfection in the creation of all the different colors and leaves and gorgeousness. How can you not see the divine beauty? What part of my heart allows me to witness that? The part that is attached to the science of Ihsan. To be able to see, to have insight beyond the eyes. To see with the eye of the heart. But God says in this hadith now that until I love him, when I love him, I become the eye with which he sees, the hand with which he grabs, and, and so on and so forth. What does that mean? That has a lot of commentary in Islamic history by the great scholars. But ultimately, the person now has achieved true happiness, true joy, true fulfillment of their purpose. Such a person, if you take away every material good and leave them to sit alone, they're going to find the presence of the divine sufficiency for their heart and happiness. That is what we're all trying to achieve. We won't achieve it through materialism. We won't achieve it through whatever you're trying to achieve it because it will dissipate. Young age doesn't last. Money does not last. Materialism will not last. The good weather doesn't last. Nothing lasts. But what does last is your connection and relationship to God. And no one can take that away from you and nothing can prevent you and nothing will stop it. Therefore, that is accessible to all human beings and that is what the Prophet Muhammad, who is the master of all of these sciences, best explained and lived it day in and day out. People came to consult him about issues of the heart every single day. And he cured them by teaching them what's good for them, by guiding them to prayers, by giving them spiritual routines. I dare any of you to look up a book called The Book of Remembrance by Imam and Nawawi. Adhkar, the Imam Nawawi. When I was teaching that book for one of the classes, there is a prayer for every single occasion. We know about the Prophet Muhammad, which shoe he put on first, which was the right foot. We knew how he entered his home, how he walked, what were his intentions, because he taught us everything. That is being vigilant because he's aware of the divine presence. When he was kind to his wives or he was kind to his neighbor because he was vigilant about the witnessing of God above and, and on him, not spatially, that's not classical Muslim theology. Okay? He was aware of the divine presence. And what did God say in one hadith it said? That God has prescribed excellence upon everything. And that's what it's all about. It's about being excellent inwardly in order to achieve that beautiful potential that the human being could reach. And there's a lot more to say, including the different Sufi intellectual contributions. Uh, Mufti Shijat, may Allah preserve him, mentioned the Ihya of Imam al-Ghazali, which is another tremendous, beautiful book on Islamic spirituality. And there's great benefit in that. 
So thank you all. I'll leave uh, with that and uh, inshallah allow time for the questions. And uh, we'll bring back our, our moderator, uh, Brother Ahmed, who, who joined us a little bit late. And he's a dear friend and a brother who's been here. I'll hand him over the mic. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairan, Imam Yahya, Mufti Shijat, and Sidi Yama for that wonderful talk. Um, before we open it up to Q&A, um, if you uh, go on menti.com and you enter this code, you can insert your questions. Um, and we'll also allow people to raise their hands as well. Um, just one quick thing I wanted to mention, um, which I feel is very a very interesting concept in Islamic theology, which I learned, which really um, helped me understand uh, a, an, an answer to one of the questions I had. And uh, if any of you would like to comment, um, by all means. Um, there's a question in academia that's usually thrown around, which says that there are thousands of thousands of religions that exist. And so why does any one religion hold a monopoly on truth? And it, it's very interesting because when one studies the Islamic tradition, but also when one studies comparative religion, what they find is that in, in the Islamic tradition, it's believed that God had sent prophets to every single land. And so it's believed that prophets were sent to the Americas, to Africa, to Asia, and all types of places in the world. And what's interesting is when we really look, because the Quran states that the, the, that the message that they taught was all generally the same message, it was the same creed that was taught. And when one studies comparative religion, they find that when you look at the great founders of many of these religions, and you really go back to the origins of their teachings, you really find a lot of similar parallels with Islam in the realms of its theology, which is quite fascinating. And so for instance, if you take a civilization like the Chinese civilization, um, does anybody know who the most influential Chinese person in history is? Confucius. Confucius. Confucius is regarded as the, most, as the most influential Chinese person that has ever existed. And his philosophy is really still at the heart of a lot of principles within the country. But if one goes to the teachings of Confucius, you can find that it's very clear that Confucius was a monotheist. And he was very clear. The Chinese had this concept of Shen Ti, uh, which later became Shen Tian, where they believed that there was this deity in the sky that took no shape and transcended time and space. Um, and the Chinese were very much against idolatry. And this existed for over a thousand years in the Chinese civilization leading up to the Communist Party. And when one studies many micro-religions, even when one studies Hinduism, if one can go back to the origins of Hinduism to its early texts, and if you really ask the Hindu philosophers, the one who really know the texts really well, they will also make an argument that, in, that at the end there's only one reality, whether, whatever, whatever deity they, uh, they call him. So it's just an interesting thing to keep in mind that God sent prophets to every single land. They all taught the same creed. But fi the final messenger that was sent, we believe, is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that his teachings are universal. But the creed that he was teaching about God was a creed that had largely pre uh, uh, existed beforehand and so forth. And so uh, before I open it up to the Q&A, is there anything anyone would like to comment on that? I was just waiting for somebody to say that the most influential Chinese is Sun Tzu. <laughs> but... <laughs> I would argue it's Confucius and I'm not. With that, um, we'll begin the Q&A session. Um, we have a handful of questions that people have already sent in. Um, but by all means, if you want to send them in anonymously, anonymously you can use this form. Um, or you can raise your hands. But first, we'll go through some of the questions that have been sent. So the first question, um, which I think perhaps we, we did touch upon, is um, why were the question is basically stating what is the purpose of human beings and why were they created solely for worship? So, uh, I think uh, it was me who raised that point, so perhaps it is directed to me. 
I don't know what you really understand out of this uh, question that you have raised here, but I, 24 hours of our time in the masjid or in the state of sajda, or in the state of worship. And therefore, I try to explain the ayah, the words from the Holy Quran that I quoted, that God created us for the sake of worship, and that the word ya'budun oftentimes is mistranslated or misunderstood or misrepresented. It is not that you just stand up in prayer before God or observe the fasting, etc. These are some ceremonial, devotional practices, but it is beyond, much more than that. It is to live our whole life you know, in submission to God. What, did, what do I mean by this? As scholars said, we do not know what is best for us as human beings. Our intelligence is very limited. And therefore, we, we all can attest to this reality. We make choices and we regret over that. Therefore, we have this divine source that leads us to what is best for us, that guides us to, the, to make the right choices in life and how to live an ethically responsible life. And this is what it means to live the whole life in the state of obedience to God. You know, the ayat, I wanted to raise this point that we live today in a very egocentric world, right? Where everyone is, you know, very much obsessed with himself or herself. I, me, mine. One of the scholars made this uh, comment, which was interesting to me, he said, to compound this crisis, we have many technologies today, and the names that they have, like iPad, iPhone, iMac, Everything is just me and me, me, nafsi, nafsi, like that, right? This is going to be the slogan, my dear brothers and sisters, on the day of judgment. We will be purely focused on ourselves. But in this dunya, we have to get out of this shell, right? So to have this sense of direction, Ibn Kasir rahimahullah Dara says, what Allah says in the, in the Quran, man ilahahu hawahu. Have you seen a person who has taken his desire as Lord? But the commentary, if you read, it will shock you. He said, you know, this is the argument that was presented by, you know, rationalists, but that's something that is true. One of the interpretation of this ayat is that whatever you like to do, you do without giving any credibility and consideration to the divine te teachings. That means you have taken yourself and your nafs as a god. So therefore, we do not know what is best for us. And this is why Quran is there and prophetic model is there. Jazakallah khairan. I have a couple of just quick questions. One, does Islam have a religious leader like a pope in Christianity? No. <laughs> <laughs> what is the dua for har So somebody's asking, um, what is the dua that one should make when somebody goes through difficult times, such as losing a, losing a loved one and so forth? What's the dua that just for th just just to go through hardship, what was what's the du'a that you would recommend? So, one of uh, my favorite uh, du'as, uh, there is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There was uh, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who was sitting in the masjid, and he was. Uh, uh, he was overcome with, uh, you know, he was very sad. He was sitting in the masjid, he was sad. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he approached him and he asked him about, uh, you know, why is it that I see you that you are so sad? And he replied by saying, That I have been overcome with anxiety, worries, concerns, and debt, right? So, uh, ironically, many times uh, the source of one's worries and concerns happen to be uh, tied to their finances as well. So, uh, th this, is, this was his answer and what the Prophet ﷺ told him is, should I not teach you uh, a prayer, a supplication that if you were to make this in the morning and in the evening, then Allah will alleviate your worries and your concerns and will enable you to get rid of your debt. And then he taught him the dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan, wa a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal, wa a'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhl, wa a'udhu bika min ghalabati al-dayni wa qahri al-rijal. That, uh, oh Allah, I seek your refuge, min al-hammi wal-hazan, from worries and grief, wal-ajzi wal-kasal. So, uh, ajz and kasal means uh, kasal is laziness so despite having the ability to do something you don't do it and ajz 
is not having the ability to do something. So this is why in, in Arabic, the extremely old and feeble are called ajuz. So this person, even if he wants to or she wants to do something, uh, the body just doesn't, uh, you know, just doesn't sustain that endeavor. So you want to, you know, like uh, an 80 year old could want to climb Mount Everest, but this, you know, they, they, they may not be able to do this because it's not that they are lazy, but they just don't have the ability to do this. So from being held back either because of my own laziness or inability, al-ajzi wal-kasal, wa'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhl, from cowardice and miserliness, and usually both of these go hand in hand. This is why you should try to be a generous person so that you will also, uh, generosity will foster courage. So the reason that uh, you know we live in a society where everybody is afraid of uh, everything is because we have become extremely stingy people. So we should uh, develop a sense of generosity and this will foster a sense of courage and uh, even for young Muslims who are st who are struggling with their identity, you know, you contributing, if not financially, then through your time and uh, through other generous means, this is going to uh, this is going to embolden you, and this is going to give you the courage to proudly display your identity. Inshallah, it's a necessary consequence of uh, of uh, of sakha and uh, generosity is is courage. So from um, so the, the dua is that I seek uh, refuge from from cowardice and from my means from being overcome by my debt and from the, the oppression of men or from the tyranny of men. So nowadays usually we owe money to institutions that you're never, you know, you're not really going to run into Van City somewhere in the mall, right? Um, so uh, it's it's not that people, they, they will pursue you. Um, well, they, they, there might come a time when people pursue you for your, for your debt, but generally you're not going to run into the person you owe money to in the street because you owe money to an institution but once upon a time uh, the the person you borrowed money from this is your neighbor this is your friend this is your classmate this is somebody that you are going to run into and uh, this is somebody who um, you know the human being Allah has not created him to be in this inferior mm -hmm. position Right? So we feel bad when someone has some sort of ihsan over us, some sort of favor over us. So from uh, being overcome by debt and from the tyranny of men, uh, so from owing anybody anything. So this, uh, this is a beautiful dua. Um, that we should all make you know all of us have worries concerns anxieties things that you know concern us in our personal lives in our professional lives and this should be a habit of yours morning and evening uh, that you make this dua every day and allah will take care of all of that for you inshallah guaranteed how do i explain to my philosophy professor that god exists as he is an atheist and has no clue about god with your permission i'd like to answer this question as somebody who did my, uh, my undergraduate here um, in history and also in philosophy, one of the things that you'll find is um, if you ever take any class where they discuss God at all, it's always presented very superficially and it's always presented in a, fair, in a very mocking manner and so forth. And the main problem that you have to identify in their arguments is that when they're looking for proof for God's existence, they're looking for something that is empirical. Something that is physical. So even for instance, if you ask them to define science, and you ask them, what do you mean by science? Most people will respond by, you know, anything that we can physically see. But historically, within the Islamic tradition, and also in, in, in the Catholic tradition, science was understood as both empirical, but also demonstrative. So that, so there was all, there was a way of knowing the world through analyzing the world, but there was also a way at, at arriving at truth through the intellect alone, through the syllogism. And so the, the problem is, is if you're going to look for a physical God, you won't find a physical God as Stevie Yama was mentioning. And so the, the, the problem before you can even get into a debate from my personal experience um, with my professors is beginning with epistemology first most. And just trying to understand how do we come to know knowledge and what are the specific epistemologies that we're going to use. Because if the person is determined that they're, that they're only going to find God if they physically see God in a microscope or through a telescope, that's never going to happen. 
But at the same time, for each person, there is, a, there is an argument that one could make. There is a design argument. But the strongest argument, if you really want to convince them, is the argument from contingency, perhaps. The argument that everything in the world is contingent. That everything, and it's impossible to have a world based on solely contingent things, that it requires a necessary being that brought it into creation. And this was the argument that the classical Muslim scholars, uh, I think perhaps it was the strongest argument that they put forth. Um, and today it is still, uh, it, it, is an, uh, it is an argument that can't be refuted because at, at the most you can say there is a necessary being, but maybe, maybe that's not God and it's something else. But in reality, if you really push that further, there's no other option and so forth. Does anybody want to build on that? Exactly. There is um, a several number, several questions pertaining to the Quran and how people can determine what is the right interpretation of a specific verse. There, so this is just so we don't keep tossing this around like a football. Otherwise, I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, I, I am definitely not the most qualified to answer this question. Um, as with anything in religion, uh, or religion meaning as with anything in Islam, uh, we rely on the system of isnad. So this is uh, the the chain of transmission for for any sacred knowledge. So unlike um, other types of knowledge which can be acquired from self-study, uh, true knowledge of the Sharia uh, in the belief of Muslims, this cannot be acquired only by self-study. It requires uh, study through this unbroken chain of isnat. So everyone that is sitting in front of you over here today, um, you know, you as a regular human being, uh, you might want to do this a little nicely, but you do have the right to know uh, who our teachers are and who their teachers were and who their teachers were and who these people they studied with going all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if someone is claiming to teach you the deen and they cannot tell you who their teachers are and who their teachers are and who their teachers are going all the way back to the Prophet wasallam, then you would probably want to choose another teacher. Right? So this is every single Imam anywhere in the world that is, that is uh, male or female, right? If this person is teaching you Islam, then this person uh, must have a sound chain of narration. So, uh, you know, you like, for example, I narrated to you a hadith, right? And this hadith is in the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, rahimahullah. Now, if one of you were to come and ask me that, Shaykh, you narrated this hadith to us, do you have an isnad for this hadith? Have you actually studied this hadith with somebody? Is it, you know, do you have a chain of transmission going back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Then I will tell you that yes, I do. As do the mashayikh sitting beside me. As does every other imam anywhere in the world. That uh, these people are people who have dedicated years of their lives uh, to the preservation of this. Uh, and uh, if someone doesn't have in isnad, if somebody doesn't have a chain, if somebody doesn't have teachers, then this is a person that you don't take your deen from. This is uh, a very serious matter, and tafsir is no different. That the interpretation of the Quran, right, there are grave warnings in the hadith tradition against interpreting the Quran uh, on your own and just based on your own intellect. Rather, we rely on the transmissions of the scholars and uh, the sahaba and the companions that came before us and this is the same with with everything right so there is something to be said about when new matters arise right so when new matters arise where there is no specific ruling in the hadith or in the Quran then there are scholars that that will rely on their knowledge of the Sharia and the spirit and the intent and the maqasid and the aims and the objectives through their years of study to formulate for you uh, the in answer to that question 
question. But as for everything uh, that that is narrated, that must be accompanied with uh, with a chain of transmission. And you, as a student, you have the right to know, right? So again, you you you, you shouldn't just go up to any random sheikh and say that sheikh. Tell me who your teacher is, right? You might want to do this nicely. The Sheikh, I'd like to inquire, you know, uh, where you studied, and this will give you an idea of, uh, you know, who their teachers are and who their teachers are. So, you know, there's uh, a basic etiquette and decorum, but apart from this, you do have uh, the right to know who uh, who their teachers are and what their isnad is. Can you repeat the hardships and anxiety to our slowly, please? <laughs> So uh, you can find this du'a, the, the most accessible place would probably be Riyadh al-Salihin. Uh, you can find this du'a in the book of du'as over there. Uh, but uh, the du'a is, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan, wa a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal, wa a'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhl, wa a'udhu bika min ghalabati al-dayni wa qahri al-rijal. There's a question that says, knowing that from the time of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam's death, the prominence of Islam has been in a state of deterioration. How can we maintain hope that our lineage will continue to uphold Islamic standards? Yeah. You skipped the last one, so I'll go after you. <laughs> this I'll go after you. Yeah. I, I've done two, so I'm yes, I'm yeah, I've done, you know, you have done that thing. Bismillah. <clears throat> the question is, from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, it's always been in the deterioration. How can we ensure, or how can we protect our legacy to continue, basically, mm -hmm. right? So, Bismillah rahman rahim from the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the best time, the best generation was his generation and those that came after him and then those that came after him. Naturally, the Prophet Muhammad was a light, never seen the likeness of in all of the history of mankind. Whether you believe in him as a prophet or not, he was given a success unlike any in the entire history of mankind. A single individual in only 23 years of prophecy, meaning that he preached at 40 and it ended in his blessed life at 63, yet spread as quickly as it did to all the regions of the world so quickly, had to have had divine presence before. Now in every time there has been, and I'm not the expert in Islamic history, Brother Ahmed can probably do a better job on that, but we as Muslims, our concern is our own selves. Now no doubt, the times that we live in, we're also in the last part of the Hadith of Jibreel. Right, and the last part is about the signs of the end of time. And we're not gonna go into that, but most of all of our scholars say that the signs of the end of time, all the minor signs have already occurred. Really, we're just waiting for the major signs. That means that there is a deterioration. No day on earth goes except the day before it was better than the day after. That's natural. How do we preserve that? The Prophet Muhammad said even at the end of time that there will be so much tribulation that a person will wake up in the morning as a believer and go to sleep as a disbeliever at night, leaving their religion. Why? Because this world by nature was a place of trial and tribulation. And every generation has their trials and tribulation. You're not going to say, you just want to be a simple Muslim, live and die and go to paradise. It doesn't work like that. There's a verse in the Quran that says, do people say that we believe and then they will not be tried and tested? They will certainly be tried as people before us. If you look at your own life, you have a lot of trials and tribulations in your own life, in your own time. Whether it was in high school, maybe they were minute, but you had your tests. Then as you get older, and maybe you graduate, you'll get a job, you'll have other tests. Some will be more severe than others. And those that are very dear to God, meaning very close and beloved, they're gonna be tested with more things. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has said that the most tried of all people are the prophets, and then those most closest to them, and then those most closest to them. Trials and tribulation is part of life. 
One of the scholars, he said that if you accept this world as a default, the place of trials and tribulations, naturally, then you'll live at peace. Meaning when you live in this world and you're wanting everything to go right, then you're going to be disappointed. You get married, you think nothing will ever go bad in your marriage, and it does, then you're shocked. You get a job, you think this is the ideal job, and then you find out lots of things are going on in that job that you really think you shouldn't be at. This is the nature of the world. But in all of that, your own life, your own responsibility is what you will be judged upon on the day of judgment. You're not going to be asked about what the community did, what people across the country did. You're going to be asked about what you did. Yes, part of your responsibility does relate to the global scale, such as having people in institutes of knowledge, preserving our legacy, that there are people that study Aqidah at the deep level. So we can answer these kind of questions about the proof of God in others through our scholastic tradition, through the classical means of how our scholars dealt with those things. That's a communal obligation. So is the preservation of the Quran, the preservation of Hadith and all these other things that we as a community, we must work together and we have a responsibility to preserve that. As Brother Ahmed goes to Zaytuna College, this is what the main intent was to produce people at that level to be able to deal with the challenges of our time. Now, I will say that as a Muslim, you shouldn't lose your faith or become weak just because you say, well, we're not the glorious people we used to be. That this is a time where stars come out. This is the time when the gems show up. This is the time where the Prophet Muhammad said there will come a time where you're in a time that if you leave one-tenth of what I brought, you will be destroyed. But there will come a time if a group holds on to one-tenth of what I brought, they will be preserved. That's obviously not the obligations. So you can't skip two days of prayers and just pray one within the two. But this is the extra. Meaning times will become very difficult. And in fact, in one hadith, he said that there will come a time when a person to hold on to his religion will be like a person who's holding on to hot coal or timber. You hold on to that. And I barbecue sometimes. And sometimes those things flick out and you just burn whatever is holding it. It's impossible. Even some really strong gloves you buy expensive can hold it, but otherwise, that's how difficult it'll be. One of the great Azhari scholars, Maliki, mentioned that at his time, that was the generation where these trials were seen at that level. That was over 200 years ago. As for our time, we're living in the real latter times of our ummah, in reality. There's a lot of test and trial. The only way you will succeed is obviously through God's grace, but through knowledge, through learning, through attaining beneficial knowledge. Beneficial knowledge is that which will preserve your faith, which I would argue preserves your happiness, joy, and love in the divine. Because our spiritual scholars say that God is experienced directly through the heart. Let the theologians argue all they like on their rational proofs. But as for the ones who have attained divine nearness, they know that divine exists through their very being of the core of their heart. Allah says in the Quran, God says, Is there a doubt about God? And atheism is a unique thing in our time that everybody knew anything has a beginning, has a creator. Call it whatever you want. As my astronomy teacher said, the one who created this world Whatever it is, I have a lot of respect. I said, why do you say that? He said, because the power it took to bring about this existence, that creator has a lot of power. And that's from a person that wasn't sure about them being in existence, creator or not. So my advice to myself and all of you is yes, these are times that you have to struggle, you have to strive, be the change you wanna see. There'll be good times, but I'm sad to tell you that there might be a lot worse times coming but that shouldn't alter your faith. Even at the time of the companions, the generation right after them, they were very sad at the deterioration of the community. And every generation of our scholars have complained about the deterioration during their time. Scholars 300 years ago said, there are no more real Sufi scholars left like there were in the early generations, like Abu Yazid al-Bistami and Fadail ibn Ayyal, and all of the great early saints, they're just gone. 
But now we are living in our time. What will happen a hundred years from now when the ummah will deteriorate more? But you won't be asked about that. We'll be asked about our personal responsibility and for your family and do the best that you can and don't worry about the rest. This is an opportunity to get the greatest reward. That's why I'll end with this. The Prophet Muhammad also said that in those times, times of tribulation and hardship, that those who hold on to their faith and protect it will have the reward of 50 of you. And the companion said, 50 of us, O oh Messenger of God, or 50 of them? He said, like 50 of you. That doesn't mean we're better than the companions ever. But, as he said, my ummah is like rain. Ummatik al matar That there will be people in the end of times that will come that will be as golden and even more shining than even the earlier generations. And that's who you want to be. And how do you strive for that? Your first starting point is the divine. Call upon him because he chooses whom he wills for his divine mercy. And with your permission, I would just like to follow up on that question. Um, there is no doubt that there is a deterioration in scholarship. But the idea that Islam as a religion is deteriorating in terms of its quantity, I think is completely false. And I think if you look at, what's interesting is if you look back just 200 years ago, arguably the second largest religion in the world was Hinduism. But Islam surpassed that about the 19th, 20th century. And by 2050, the estimates are that Islam will be the number one religion in the world in terms of its quantity. And if you think about this, think about this, I think this is very interesting. In what place are people isolated the most in a society? Who are the most isolated people in all of society? The people who are most neglected? There you go. The people in jail are those who are most isolated from the entire world, and yet, in record numbers, they're all converting to Islam. In the United States and in Canada, it's a huge problem because uh, not, not all of the places have cha Muslim chaplains. But now that there's so many Muslims in prisons, and why are they converting in prison? What is it that made Malcolm X convert to Islam? Right, the great icon of the 20th century, one of the most influential figures, and then Muhammad Ali and so forth. By 2050, I believe Britain is supposed to be 15% Muslim. Germany is supposed to be 17% Muslim. France is supposed to be 14% Muslim. Canada right now is 4% Muslim. A hundred years ago, all these numbers were around 1% or 2%. What is it about the religion that the religion is spreading despite, despite trillion dollar propaganda campaigns that Islam is a horrible religion, that Islam oppresses women, that Islam is responsible for all the world's problems? Why is it that now, Islam is, being, uh, Islam is spreading every single place on the planet and in record numbers. So I would, I would contend that Islam, the religion is not de deteriorating. The religion will always be there and it's impossible to kill a religion. And so I think Islam, not only is it thriving, I think it's thriving rapidly fast. Even in Japan, the fastest growing religion is Islam. SubhanAllah. Um, there's a question that says that I recently converted to Islam. My family is biased and they have a deep hatred for Islam. They believe that it is a religion of crime. How do I approach them? They are my family, so I can't just give them up. I think this can contribute. <laughs> so, in, in my experience, what draws people to Islam people who, are, who otherwise have a negative view of the faith. For such people, it's, it's very hard to convince them through, through any, any rational argument why Islam is the faith that you chose. You can sit there all day and talk about the beauty of Islam and talk about the beauty of our beliefs and talk about uh, uh, all of the wonderful things, but that doesn't have the same effect as your family witnessing you, uh, brother or sister, whoever you are, becoming a better version of yourself or a better person through your embrace of the faith. So, uh, of course, this takes time. 
So if you, all of us have things that we need to work on, uh, whether you were born Muslim or you embrace the faith, but in particular those whose families are hostile towards the faith, the first thing is guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah guides whom he wishes, but the most effective thing in in my experience with individuals like this is the family witnessing a positive change in their son their daughter their grandson granddaughter whoever it is their brother sister who has accepted islam and uh, this takes years sometimes right um, so we have people like uh, sheikh hamza yusuf in the states so Sheikh Hamza's uh, parents, uh, now Sheikh Hamza is, is considered one of the giant who have made a logical, rational argument that makes sense. Uh, perhaps no one can make one better than Sheikh Hamza, but uh, this is, you know, this is something that took years. And uh, uh, perhaps a lot of uh, what impressed his parents or what convinced them to embrace the faith in the end before they left this world is perhaps his conduct more than his knowledge. And I'll let my... Uh, uh, my colleagues uh, further this, inshallah. So, no. After me is you. <laughs> no. Yeah, well, the, uh, first of all, I would like to, I'm not sure who that is, congratulate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on your steadfastness and may you be a very shining beacon light for your whole family and, and everyone around you so that they see the beauty of the faith, inshallah, through your own practice. I totally can, you know, endorse what the Allah said, but I would, I would like to add two more points here. So Allah and Sayyidina Muhammad. Number one, as Quran clearly states, and uh, the Sheikh has also mentioned, Hidayat is the only thing that is the sole property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not in the hand of anyone. Therefore, SubhanAllah, we see even our Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, Quran in numerous places is, you know, it is something to really think about. The agony, the concern, the worry that he, the, he had, not just for one or two, the whole of humanity. What does Allah say about him? To con comfort him, to console him. Are you going to you know, uh, kill yourself? Are you going to cause harm to yourself because of this worry and concern that you have for others, for their hidayat? This, is the, this was our Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam. And we find him many ahadith as well. So on this note, what is our job, apart from what the Shaykh has said, is to make sincere dua always for them. You know, making sincere supplication to Allah, asking, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their hidayat and for their guidance. And second thing is, I'll read the stories of Sahaba Rizmanullahi alayhi wa the Prophet's companions. They, you know, they had some of the, as great as Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the one who is seen as the best after Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and among all the companions. Yet, when did his father convert to Islam? You know, at the time of Fatih Makkah. Literally towards the end of the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So you can find what I'm trying to say, solace and comfort. You are not the only one. The best of the best had to go through this. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, our Prophet, how much did he really, how much did he want to convert his uncle, right? Yet, until the last moment, until the last moment, he was hopeful that he would utter the shahadat. But even when he did not, he said, I'm going to continue to seek forgiveness of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for you. Then ayat came down, you are not allowed to do so. So we must be hopeful, that's what I'm trying to say, and find solace and comfort in these stories that we find in our tradition. Um, I don't have much to add except that um, be patient because uh, another big sheikh in the West recently I was with him and he told me that his parents his whole life he had struggled to convert them and we were together and he said recently his mother converted and then also his father converted and that was really great news. It happened that one of the great scholars of Yemen sent some prayer beads with him to hand over to his father. And when he gave it to him, he said, this is from Habib, those who know. He said, but what do I do with this? I have to be Muslim. And his mother looked at him and said, it's time you uttered the Shahada. And then he did, and he converted. And these are two of the prominent people in the West 
May Allah bless both of them. But it also shows you can't give up. In the seerah, I'm teaching just yesterday, we're looking at the arguments of uh, Abu Sufyan after the battle of Uhud, yelling out, glory be to Hubal. And all these things going back and forth with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He ends up converting. But like at the last moments to where even people doubted his Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam exonerated his Islam saying that he is, whoever enters his house is safe. He's a companion. So when you have a good opinion of Allah and you do the best that you can, don't give up hope even if it's in the last moments. Why? Because a person can convert even on the last hour or even last 10 minutes that they're alive. Until then, you might go through hardship. You might go through difficulty. But did the Prophet not do that? Was he not peace of blessings be upon him? Attacked by people, spat out on by people, treated in the worst of ways. What did he do? He never gave up on them. Even with the hypocrites. That, if you can do so, I know it's a big test. It's a big test. But also to this person who asked this question, I would say you need to make sure you keep company of people that support you in your faith. Don't be alone. Be with other Muslims that can strengthen you and give you support. Because if you're all alone, it becomes very difficult because one of the toughest things you're tested with is those who are very close and beloved to you. And when they don't accept it, it really brings you down. But let me give you a last story. Musab ibn Umayr, one of the notable companions, when he was in Medina early on to give da'wah of Islam, he looked like the Prophet Muhammad. He was a very handsome man. He was very eloquent. But his brother was caught in one of the wars against the Muslims after Badr. And he was being tied up as a captive because he was fighting. And then he had a lot to say. And Musab ibn Umayr told the companions, his mother is very rich, careful, because you know you can get good ransom. And he looked at him and he said, Aren't you my brother? He said, yes, I'm your brother, but you're just, he was just fighting them, trying to kill them. They were the aggressors. But he said, the guy who's tying you up, that's my brother. So we're brethren in humanity, but you should really find special support in those who embrace your faith, because although we love for all of humanity what we love for ourselves, there's a special bond with those who are your brethren in faith, that they strengthen you and they help you and they're there for support in the community as well. At this point in time, we want to open the floor up to any questions. We have more questions, but if anybody wants to raise their hand, um, by all means, go ahead. Yes. The question is that if Muslims, Christians, and Jews worship the same God, um, why are there so many differences and who created those differences? You have interviewed, mashallah, a number of times, and so I'm sure you have more insight in this. Uh, Quran, if you read from this point of view, clarifies this issue itself. There are a number of issues that we have with Jewish community and Christian community. I don't mean like in a, in a problematic manner, on a theological uh, ground. So first and foremost, when it comes to Christianity, of course, they believe in Trinity, which we don't believe in. So we cannot say that we, we worship the same God in that sense. Yes, one of the components of Trinity is this, which we believe in. And, and with respect to Judaism, we do have the same understanding of God, but there are other areas that are completely different. And so Rasulullah in one hadith he said that Al Anbiya that all the prophets they are paternal brothers. Their mothers are different, but the father in the religion is the same. So in the essence, all the prophets of Allah priest and taught mankind is the three things that were in common unity of God, prophethood, and the belief in the hereafter. But the the living sharia, the, the, the laws that they brought, they differed from time to time. 
because we don't want to have the very very primitive laws that were given to, for example, Prophet Noah or earlier communities who had very simple lifestyle that didn't have much challenges as we have today. Right? So therefore, the beauty of Islam, it is a, the religion that is very much compatible to all times and places. So they, those who would not believe in all of this, in fact, Quran, when Brother Ahmad is Allah here, very much insightful answers, when he was commenting on this issue of how to explain Islam to philosophers, for example. So there is one ayat in the Quran that came to my mind. Allah says in Surah Al-Mu'minun, أَفَلَمْ يَدَّبَّرُوا الْقَوْلِ أَمْ جَاءَهُمْ مَا لَمْ يَأْتِ آبَاءَهُمْ الْأَوْلِينَ do they not reflect on Quran? Is there something that is completely different that they have, that they have received that, that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu And he, in essence, it is the same. But over the years, there was a adulteration, change in the message. Therefore, it got completely corrupt. And we have, therefore, the, the, the message of Islam in the true, pure sense. So therefore, whoever would accept that would join this, this universal religion. And whoever would deny, then they would be seen as those who are not part of our tradition. That's what I can say on this end. Maybe other Mashaq can come to add to it. I would, I would just like to add that um, Islam, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Islam believes that, um, that, w that when Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, or Musa alayhi salam, Moses, peace be upon them both, uh, when they were given revelation, that the revelation taught a clear monotheism. Now when we study the historical backdrop, we can see that there were alterations made in both of the religions. With Christianity, it's quite notable. In the third century, when the Council of Nicaea occurs, and there are about 20 different Gospels, and ultimately we, are, we arrive at four Gospels, um, even though some of the Gospels that are chosen are ones that are <coughs> from people who studied with uh, the Hawariyin, the, the disciples of Isa alayhi salam. So those ones were neglected, like the Gospel of, Gospel of Peter, but other ones were chosen. And now if you read someone like Bart Ehrman, his books have clearly shown that there was a tampering with the religion and that the theology had changed and so forth. Um, and what's quite fascinating is that the Quran tells the story of Musa alayhi salam and of the cows. And here you have one of the greatest prophets that God Almighty has ever sent to a people. And they had just seen the Red Sea split. And so they had every indication that this was a prophet of God. But yet, when Musa salam goes for 40 days, by the time he comes back, the people are worshipping a calf. So all it took was just 40 days for the entire religion to change completely. And so if we're looking at, you know, with Christianity about 2,000 years of history and with Judaism probably around 4,000 years of history, there's no doubt that alterations could have taken place. And the Quran has given us that story, it appears, to show that religions can corrupt even overnight and so forth. So originally the creed that, was, that they were taught was monotheism, but that it changed over time. Allah Allah. Are there any questions from the crowd? Yes. The way I would look at this is, first of all, when it comes to the means, we cannot blame God for the behavior and actions of criminal human beings that do these wrong actions. 
we as Muslims believe that God is just, that he created a world in which he tests human beings, and that human beings unfortunately can do terrible things. That includes murder, that includes theft, that includes terrorism, that includes a lot of things. This world was not created as a place where justice takes place right away. God has allowed that. In our theology, we believe God has will, and that his will extends to both good and evil, that he allows it. But we also have a concept that he doesn't have contentment over that, what we call Rida, that these are different. In other words, the will of God, because he allows something to happen in creation, does not mean that he's pleased with it. Rather, he has forbidden it, that there shouldn't be injustice, there shouldn't be killing. He commanded to justice. But because these sins and these criminal acts takes place, just because he allows it does not mean he's content. Now, when children go through this hardship or they die from it or anything else, we as Muslims believe they go straight to paradise. The reality of paradise is when a person is dipped into paradise for a single second and they are the worst tribulated person you can imagine, they're asked the question, do you remember any day of hardship? They go, I swear by God, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't remember any day of hardship in the world. In other words, that we're going to have to wait for a time when everything will make sense. And that will not be in this world. When we look at it from the lens of just this world and only this world, then things will become clouded for us and we'll ask, why would God do that? The ultimate reality is that the world in its reflection of how it's created, if you go deep into this, will necessitate that God must be all-knowing and all-wise. Because otherwise, there's no way he could have been perfectly created the heavens and the earth with such proportion. Therefore, if he is absolutely all-knowing and wise, why would he allow this? We don't ask that why, because then that means the deficiency is in our own minds. The deficiency is in our own understanding, not on God Almighty. And then chapter 18 of the Quran, this is highlighted in a story between Moses and a man named Al-Khidr, where he does things outwardly that makes no sense to Moses in reality. He questions him, why do you do this and why do you do that? Then at the end, he explains the reasons for his actions. That the reasons of the divine wisdom are unknown to us. In fact, some of the scholars, they say that in reality, if God were to remove the veils of your limitation to see the true wisdom of his, you would not find a single thing out of place in his divine wisdom in the world. But we cannot see that. We see one thing and we say, this is wrong. Of course, it is wrong. And in Islamic law, there are penalties for when someone does crimes and injustices and difficult things. But the reality is, this exists and exists every day. There are people that get kidnapped. There are people that get raped in the United States every seven or nine minutes. These are actions of the human beings that God will bring them to account on the day of judgment. God will take vengeance over that actions that they did and he'll set everything right. But as we stand now, we as Muslims believe you cannot say, God, why did you do that? Because there is divine wisdom. You do not have the necessary capability to understand all that divine wisdom. But as Muslims, we don't blame God. That would be bad etiquette. We blame the human being. It's like you're sitting next to somebody and the person takes coffee. I have a habit of this. And, you know, you just pour coffee on the person. And the next guy goes, why would God allow that? You just burned yourself. Why would God allow that? I did that. I took the coffee and poured it on. I hit somebody. I drove fast. I wronged somebody. Then you said, why did God do that? We don't think in those terms, although in reality, God does allow that, but it's for wisdom and reason. I hope that kind of helps. How many of you have seen a movie before? Stop. <laughs> you we, we, got, we got them on camera too. <laughs> so, there is, uh, so there's usually a room like that somewhere in the back of the theater, if memory serves me correctly, right, from back in the day. And uh, 
I'm not sure how they broadcast films nowadays, but you know, once there used to be this huge reel that kind of spins and broadcasts the, the film onto a screen like this, and that's how you watch movies, right? In the theater. So it's sometimes very difficult to understand without context a single scene, right? So if somebody were to show you just uh, a, and that's actually how they do it, right? So they show you a trailer of uh, you know what you can expect, and that's uh, you know they sell you on on purchasing the ticket to watch the entire movie. Uh, but it is it is impossible to understand uh, the the storyline from watching a single scene. So similarly, you and I, what we currently have access to in this world is the single scene that we are in. Right? And if we were to, you know, unwind that entire movie reel of our entire lives and even further the entire existence of humanity, things make a lot more sense. Now, that's not possible while we're in this world. So we have access to immediately what's happening right now and what has happened in the, the near past for us, right? So a lot of us, you know, unfortunately, we can't even remember what we had for lunch. But, you know, we, have, we, we remember things in the near past. But apart from that, you know, we don't have access to the big picture, right? We don't have access to the big picture. And part of our duty as Muslims is Iman bil ghaib. So this is literally, you know, in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بالغيب, That the believers are those who believe in the unseen. So if you were given access to everything, and all of us were given access to all of the divine wisdom, then, you know, this is not Iman bil ghaib That you have now, uh, you know, the proof has been established in front of you, and uh, you have access to all of the wisdom, and then you believe, then that, you know, even on the day of judgment, people will believe after everything has been presented in front of them, right? That there will be people that, that will say that let us go back, right? Let us go back and now we will believe because we have seen. But that's not what is the, the, the requirement of the individual. The requirement of the individual and the test of the individual is to believe without seeing, right? So your belief sh in the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should, it doesn't always have to make sense, Right? It doesn't, that's not the requirement. You are not going to be questioned regarding whether the decree of God made sense to you. That's not going to be one of the questions on the Day of Judgment. The question is whether you believed in the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether you submitted to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you believed in everything that took place in this world, there was some form of justice, whether or not you and I, we can see that justice or not. And the last thing that I will end with is, you know, for the atheist or for somebody who doesn't believe in God, right, they, they are in a very difficult situation, to be honest, right? So you and I, you know, there are terrible things happening all over the world to Muslims in every, every corner of the globe. And how do we sleep at night, right? We sleep at night because we know وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ غَافِلًا عَمَّا يَعْمَلُ الظَّالِمُونَ إِنَّمَا يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ لِيَوْمٍ تَشْخَصُ فِيهِ الْأَبْصَارِ That don't think that Allah is unaware of what the oppressors do. Allah is giving them the leeway until the day where things and matters will become clear. Now for us, we sleep at night because we know that if our brothers and sisters cannot attain justice in this world, then there is an akhirah and Allah will give them what they deserve and Allah will punish their oppressors in the manner that they deserve. The atheist, people get away with ter terrible, terrible crimes all the time in this world, right? So dictators die after, you know, uh, oppressing thousands and thousands of people over the course of decades of their lives, and they are never held to account in this world. Or even if they are held to account, uh, then, you know, it's, it pales in comparison to what they've actually done to people. So, how, you know, the atheist is, is going to become depressed at this, that this man literally butchered hundreds hundreds of thousands of people throughout his life and he left scot-free 
But because they don't believe in an akhirah, they don't believe in being held accountable. The way we sleep at night is because we know that, you know, whether or not he gets caught in this world, whether any just or unjust court of this world punishes this individual, we believe in the court of God, nobody is going to get away with their crimes, and every single human being will be held accountable if they have wronged somebody. So this is how we sleep at night. And this is, this is the concept of justice that brings us peace and contentment, despite the, the things that go on in this world. So I, I hope that uh, that in addition to what Imam Yama said, this also uh, partially answers your question, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. And I just wanted to add um, something interesting about the story of Khidr and Musa alayhi salam is specifically towards your question. Is because when people talk about the problem of evil, they're usually thinking, um, you know, with all the evil in the world. But the question that you've identified is a very specific question. And it's also a very specific question that the new atheist movement, people like Stephen Fry and Sam Harris specifically chose, that about the child, specifically. And I think it's so beautiful because in the Quran, Allah gives that story where Khidr and Musa approach a child, right? He approaches a child. And then when Khidr uh, murders a child, and then Musa asks why, and then later on he reveals to him, he says that the, the parents of this child were very honorable and righteous. And the child would grow up to be a tyrant, somebody who would cause a lot of corruption. So to save the parents, Allah wanted to honor them with a righteous child, and so this needed to be done. But two things that are fascinating about this uh, story is one, is because the child passed away before they reached the age of maturity, they're granted entry into paradise. And then secondly, what one of my teachers told me in the tafsir of the, of the ayah is that Allah honored that family by giving them a daughter, a righteous daughter. And that daughter married a prophet. And then a prophet entered their lineage. And then they had a child who was a prophet as well. And so that's how Allah honors people. But everything that was said here um, is I think, you know, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that specific question is identified in the Quran and is given a solution. So I think maybe we'll do one or two more questions if, uh, if anybody, uh, we have some online, but if anybody would like to raise their hand. Yes. So for those who couldn't hear, this, the, the question that the sister asked is uh, new reverts, uh, people who embrace the faith, um, there, there is a lack of resources in the community for uh, teaching these individuals uh, the basics of uh, the practice of their faith and uh, you know, what are the next steps. Um, so I would partially agree with you that there are not as many resources as there should be for, uh, for those who are new to the faith, uh, but it's, uh, it's not uh, entirely doom and gloom. There are, uh, there are some resources available in the community. So for example, uh, most masajid are able to connect you um, it will usually not be the Imam himself, but they will be able to connect you with individuals uh, within the community, both male and female, that serve as uh, kind of mentors to new Muslims. So these, and by the way, if anybody sitting over here would like to volunteer for something like this, uh, you can uh, you can see us. We we are always in need of more people. Um, so these are individuals that you know um, that are just paired with uh, with these new Muslims, and uh, they're there just as uh, they're kind of new. Muslim friend that they can bounce uh, regular everyday questions. Um, the Richmond Jamia Masjid has uh, um, a monthly meetup of new uh, of new converts. Um, there are uh, the. There are other programs in, for example, in Ajial uh, and in other masajid. Uh, you know, the, I'm I'm thinking of these things uh, off the top of my head uh, that uh, that serve specifically new Muslims. And apart from this, um, you know, there are many programs available in the community uh, that are not necessarily targeted towards new Muslims, uh, but they are fiqh. 
classes, for example. So, you know, the fiqh of a new Muslim is no different than the fiqh of a Muslim who has been practicing for years and years. So any basic introductory class on fiqh uh, will serve a, a new Muslim very well. There are plenty of uh, good resources online. Although, you know, one thing that I will say is, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, they are very interested in uh, after they convert you to Islam, to convert you into their particular brand of Islam. So that's something that <laughs> that is uh, that is often um, you know a challenge. So uh, be wary of the resources that you use online and in person. And I will I'm sure that the other mashayikh have other things uh, to add to this. Inshallah. In addition to what Sheikh has said, what I would like to suggest, you know, mashallah, these days we have access to the internet world, and if you check the websites of the local masajid here, without having to go specifically to each and every masjid and trying to reach out, then you you would know the programs that they offer. For example, certain programs, mashallah, are offered in Berlin, and many are offered in Richmond Masjid. This will give you a the longer idea to know what you are already looking for exactly, the specific type of service that you are in need of it. So two types of things that you could uh, find out that you may, be, you may be interested in. One is the social support. The other one is the educational programs. Right? So in terms of social support, there are certain, mashallah, brothers and sisters. You know, for example, if you reach out to any imam, you not necessarily he may be able to help you, but he will be able to connect you to X, Y, Z sisters. And I have Mashallah, some sisters that I know personally, that I have, alhamdulillah, whenever there is a sister who converts to Islam, I call her and then I make, connect her to her. And she, mashallah, takes care of her very well. Sister Ida, I think Mufti Ayasa also knows her, and a few others. So this is going to be a big support. And with respect to the educational programs, you need to, like I said, you know, reach out to the Messiah or the Imams and put forward your person need that you are interested in and they will be able to lead you and guide you in this case that's what inshallah is going to be helpful and uh, we have a resource sitting here uh, and i asked his permission to identify him. brother atnan is sitting in the uh, side over there uh, who is uh, very active in the da'wah world and uh, he has uh, mashallah uh, access to plenty of uh, community resources and brothers and sisters uh, that uh, you know um, honestly he lives in burnaby so uh, in uh, uh, in the masjid whenever someone accepts islam um, we average a few shahadas a month alhamdulillah um, and uh, if I ask permission from these individuals if they would like to be connected to someone within the Muslim community and uh, I, I don't have the specific type of individual that this person is looking for, we usually try to connect them with somebody similar to them uh, in age, gender, if possible, if language is a barrier, then also language. So we have uh, new Muslims quite often that uh, English is not their first language. So uh, Spanish uh, is sometimes uh, their first language. French, um, uh, there are uh, Spanish and French. Uh, lately, there was, uh, uh, you know, over the course of a few months, there was. Uh, um, uh, a bunch of uh, sisters from the Philippines who accepted Islam. So, mashallah, sure. there are sisters from the Philippines uh, in Richmond that we are able to connect them to. But Brother Adnan is an excellent resource himself, and he's also able to connect you to many others, inshallah. And I would just add that SFU MSA has a lot of resources as well. Um, I think with that, we will conclude. Um, we will take any questions afterwards. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, um, I don't know about the Imams, but I'll be here for a while, so feel free to ask me. And I believe there is food here, um, just outside. The food will be brought here. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, it was a great week for Islam Awareness Week. Thank you to our scholars for speaking and take, dedicating the time out, inshallah. Um, and I think we will end with just a short dua from Imam Yahya, inshallah. Imam Yahya is throat is very dry. <laughs> 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 the English is important. <laughs> the most senior in age. <laughs> 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 Our 
beautiful Creator, we ask you for guidance, for your grace in all of our affairs, that you align us with our purpose to which you created us for. We ask you that you open up the depths of our heart to recognize your beauty in all around us, in your creation. From the manifestation of your divine names, of mercy, of guidance, of the light of the heavens and the earth, O oh Allah, illuminate our hearts with faith in you. O oh Allah, bless us to recognize you in all of our affairs, that everything in this world has a purpose and a reason, and that we fulfill our role in the short time that we are on earth. O oh Allah, bless anyone who is looking for guidance with guidance. O mm -hmm. oh Allah, anybody who has hardships and difficulties in this gathering, remove their difficulties and hardships. O oh Allah, anyone here that has a need, Allah fulfill their need. Allah guide us in all of our affairs. O oh Allah, anyone who is searching for meaning and purpose through this gathering, bless them with that and open up their hearts to that. O oh Allah, we thank you for the blessing of Islam. We thank you for recognizing our purpose and existence. O oh Allah, we ask that you reward those who have put this program together that who strive in this week to spread the beautiful teachings of the last prophet of yours on earth, our beloved Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him and all of the prophets who walked on earth, who taught humanity, who guided humanity, but humanity turned away from clear guidance. O oh Allah, don't make us of those who turn away from clear guidance. Don't make us of those who have deaf ears to guidance, who hear but don't reply, don't, don't respond in a manner that pleases you. O oh Allah, we ask you for a full, correct implementation of all of the three elements mentioned tonight. That you bless us with true faith in you and Amen. That you grant us a true following of the sacred law of Islam. And that you grant us all the spiritual blessings of the sciences of Islam. And that we leave this world when you are pleased with us. And that we enter into the next stage of our existence with joy and happiness and the witnessing of your divine favors. And we ask you all of this by your noble rank and the rank of your blessed names and its virtues and by the right of those who ask and call upon you. O oh Allah, bless our gathering and making a gathering of blessed people that now depart completely forgiven of all their wrong actions and then spread upon this earth to spread that light. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.